Welcome to our Living Word Home Church service. I hope you're doing well. I'm Pastor Benny. And if you're joining us for the first time, thank you for being a part of this time with us as we learn and grow in God's Word together. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day for all you dads. I hope you're looking forward to having a good day today. Uh, I just want to wish you a good time and a blessing uh, of a day. Amen. Today, we're going to be focused on constant connection with God. I want to remind us, though, that, you know, this is not about judgment. This is about getting closer to God. But before we get started, let's just pray. Let's just bow our heads right now. Father, we thank you. 
For your word, which you promised, will not be returned void. We ask you to search our heart, our mind, our soul, our spirit. Lord, we thank you for the work you started in us, O oh Lord, and that work that which you will finish. We thank you for your blessing this day. In Jesus' name, and all the saints said, amen and amen. Well, a constant connection with God. How's that sound? You know, have you ever heard the expression, put your money where your mouth is? You know, we used that a lot when I was a kid. Almost like saying, prove it. You know, or are you willing to bet your life on it? You know, show me the money. You know, that kind of attitude. When we talk about uh, maintaining a connection with God, we're talking about devotion, folks. Putting our faith where our mouth is. Or should I say, where our action is. If you trust God, where's your faith to prove it? Folks, I want to remind us, and I want to make this very clear that this is not about judgment. So I want us to know that we are drawing, trying to get us closer to God when we get into these sermons. Amen? So let's talk about devotion. And when we're talking about devotion, we're not talking about a part-time job either. The Word doesn't tell us to neglect our responsibilities or give up our pursuit of happiness. If you've been following us for the last several weeks, we've been talking about the journey to pre-deciding. So let's start with the book of John. You know, I want us to listen to how many times Jesus uses this one word. See if you can figure out that one word, what that one word is. You know, you will find that he's using it more than any other word in this verse. As a matter of fact, to be uh, uh, exact, he's, he probably uses it about 11 times. Now, I don't think you're going to miss it. But in case you do, I want you to turn to the book of John, chapter 15, verse 4 through 11, the NIV version. And this is Jesus. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. He said, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and wither. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He said, this is my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I mean, I know that's a mouthful, but that is powerful. Now, in these verses, Jesus is saying that we bear much fruit. I mean... The Greek word for fruit here is kapos, and it means the visible power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Again, for those who are brought into a living union with Christ Jesus, if we remain and maintain a constant connection with God. Now I want you to turn to the book of John, chapter 15, verse 16 and 17. Again, the NIV version. He says, you did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Imagine what he's saying here to us. Folks, let's ask. Let's get to a place where we can just ask. If you still haven't figured out what that word is, I'll give you a clue. The word is remain. Now, the definition of remain here in the English dictionary, it says to endure, stay, live, to continue to possess a particular quality or fulfill a particular role. You know, as you heard last week, Lauren said, finish. Let's finish, folks. Turn your Bible to John chapter 15, verse 10, the NIV version again. He says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, 
just as I have kept my father's commands and remained in his love. Think about what he is saying here to us right now, today. You know, that Greek word remain, you know, it, like in verse four, it says it, it is the Greek word is mino. That's right. Mino. And mino means abide, live in, dwell, sometimes indicating perseverance to continuing or to maintain in a place instead of leaving or quitting. That's right. Even during times of difficulties or even or affliction. I mean, this is going to be applied to when relationships are not going well. Or a job that you want to leave because it's become unbearable. Or you have to deal with people who are unbearable. Or when you are facing physical challenges or even ministry when it's not working the way you expect it to go. Whatever it is, whoever it is, remember to abide. Remember, Jesus also makes two distinctions regarding the prune, this pruning process. Separating is one, and cutting back is two. You know, fruitful branches are cut back to promote growth. Sometimes God has to dip, discipline us, strengthen our character and our faith. God is always giving even, even to those who make superficial commitments an opportunity to repent before cutting them and tossing them aside. I know, superficial commitment. Where did that come from? No judgment. We're here to learn and grow. But we're going to get back to this superficial commitment in a little bit. I want you to turn to the book of John, chapter 15, verse 16, the NLT version here. And Jesus said, you, and I want to remind you this, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask. Whatever you ask for using my name. You might want to underline appointed. This is not an accident. This is a divine appointment. God chose you specifically. You may not feel that you are capable, qualified, whatever the case may be, but he chose you and I. What to do what? Bearing fruit. And that fruit is about love and joy and peace. And here's an ouch, long-suffering. That's right, long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. But this, lo this long-suffering has power. Nothing superficial will be able to withstand the testing of our faith, especially when we are using, trying to use physical solution to solve spiritual problems. It won't last. Long suffering is about maintaining integrity. The Greek word for, oh, for long suffering is uh, macrotomia, and it means patience. It's a quality of self-restraint when provoked. It is also the opposite of anger. It's associated with mercy and hope. It doesn't just surrender to circumstances or buckle under pressure or trials. It is sustained. It is devoted, committed. Are we hearing this? You know, the fruits he's talking about here is kindness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and temperance. Many of us, you know, we try to do good. We want to be good, honest people who try to do the right thing. But Jesus says that the only way to live a truly good life is to stay close to him. Stay connected, constantly connected with God. Like a branch attached to, attached to the vine. Apart from Christ, our efforts are unfruitful. So the question is, are or here is, are we receiving nourishment in our life offered by Christ? If not, we're missing the big picture here. We're missing out on this connection that God wants us to have so that we can ask of anything. See, God is glorified when people come into a right relationship with him. And they begin, and then they will begin to bear fruit in their lives. But what exactly is a right relationship with God? Ask yourself. It's when our lives are intertwined with His. 
We will, he will help us walk through adversity without sinking into those debilitating highs and lows or depressing moments. And he even helps us manage prosperity without having to fall into that trap of deception. But here's the key. I want you to turn to your book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33, the NIV version. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, this is when we offer him our unqualified obedience. When we obey him because we know he loves us. So we pre-decide to love him no matter what. Yeah, that's right. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 34, the MSG version. He says, give your entire atten attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. He says, God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. See, God's already prepared to help us no matter what. I love that. He's not saying love him after we get what we want. He says regardless of what we're facing, regardless of what's happening. You, you probably heard this before and you heard it last week. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Let's be consistent and trusting and pre-deciding to trust God. Tell me, have you ever been disappointed about your life or how it turned out? Stupid question, right? We all have. Jesus' followers, his disciples, after his resurrection, they devoted themselves despite of their failures, despite of their imperfections. I want you to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 and 43, the Amplified Version. He said, they were continually and faithfully devoting themselves to the instructions of the apostles and to fellowship and to eating meals together and to prayers. And it says, a sense of awe was felt by everyone and many signs and wonders. Many miracles were being taking place through, through the apostles. Now, that was due to the constant connection with God. And with one another. Folks, iron sharpening iron. Let's take a peek of a few other guys that we've been discussing the last few weeks in the book of Daniel. You know, you've heard Daniel, Shadrach, Mishap, and Abednego. You know, listen to Daniel's devotion here. As he's begging for mercy. Not help, but mercy. Not for himself either. I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 15 through 19, the easy read version. Lord our God, I said, you brought your people out of the country called Egypt by your power. You caused many people to know your name. Many people know about you still. But we did more wrong things and we have been very bad. Lord, you have always done what is right. Please stop being angry with the people from Jerusalem. It is your special city. All the people that live around us laugh about Jerusalem in a bad way. And they laugh about your people. That is happening because our fathers were so bad and we have been evil too. So now, our God, I am praying to you. Please listen to me because I am your servant. Listen to me while I pray, so then the people will know that you are God. Lord, be kind to your empty house. Listen to us. Lord, look at the city that belongs to you. Nobody lives there now. We, don't, we do not pray for things because we are good. We pray to you because you are kind. Lord, listen, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Listen, because the city and your people are yours. Do something quickly. Then people will know that you are God. Listen to Daniel's plea here. I mean, he is truly genuine. Daniel's crying out to the Lord out of true concern for the nation and his people. So often we, we are praying without passion, without compassion. You know, I'm ashamed to say this, but 
I'm guilty. Sometimes I feel I'm not, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm so caught up in the responsibility and the obligation to pray that I forget to pray with that true purpose, with that passion. You know, that's supposed to come with having empathy. It has to come from the heart. We might be predecided to pray, but let's not forget our purpose for praying. You know, I'm going to ask this church for the next couple of weeks to devote themselves to praying for someone specifically. Someone who you know the needs prayer, who is struggling. And folks, if you can, and if you don't have someone, we'll find someone for you if you're interested in praying, committing, devoting yourself this way. You need to send them a message as well, if they're welcoming to it. If you know them, and I'm not talking pray, pray for just anyone you know that you've been doing regularly, find someone that really do need it. And maybe you might want to send a word of encouragement. Again, if it's welcome. And even just saying a nice, have a nice day. Folks, this is about iron, sharpening iron. Having your own personal struggle is not an excuse to excuse yourself from this either. Putting your money where your faith is. Put in your energy where your prayer is. I love that. I also love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I, wanna, I want to talk about that a minute. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar was furious with them because they wouldn't bow down and worship him and his statue. And I know this story is pretty... Uh, Dramatic, even drastic even. But I love that they were set in their convictions. And that's what I'm asking us from us now today. To be set on our convictions when we do pray for someone. They were an example of what it meant to be faithful. They maintained their integrity. Folks, if we are only partly devoted to God... Ask yourself, how can we be partly connected to the vine? I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 3 through 5, the easy read version. So all the officers came. Those were the rulers, the judges, and the wise people, and all the leaders in the different regions of Babylon nation. They all came together to respect the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had built. Then an officer shouted out loud, Listen to me, you people from every country and nation and who speak different languages. The king makes this command. Listen for the sound of music from trumpets, flutes, lyres, harps, and any other kind of music. When you hear the music, you must bend down towards the ground. You must worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has built. Folks, how often do we bend down to our selfish desires, our lusts, our, you know, pressures from our society and culture that pressures us to indulge in even its immoral statues? You know, Sometimes, I don't know if you have ever been pressured this way, but if you don't fornicate, they sometimes you make you feel like you're doing something wrong, that you don't belong. If you don't vaccinate, you probably lose your cut off, you lose your privilege. Sounds familiar? And I'm not saying that being vaccinated is a bad thing. I'm just saying about the pressure that sometimes it's put on us. Folks, when you stand for God, you will stand out. I'm going to say that again. When you stand for God, you will stand out. And here's an ouch moment. Standing for God might be painful, but not regrettable. It's not always pleasant. Turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 6 through 15, the easy read version. The king will punish anyone who does not do that. His soldiers will throw them immediately into the very hot fire. So when all the people heard the different kinds of music, they obeyed. The people from every country and nation who spoke different language, they all bent down towards the, the ground. 
They worshiped the gold statue and that King Nebuchadnezzar had built. Then some wise men went to the king and they told the bad, uh, him bad things against the Jews. They tell the king, you made a rule. You said that everyone must listen to the sound of this music, the special music. When they heard it, they must bend down and they must worship the ghost statue. You said that. You will punish everyone who does not obey you. You will throw them into the middle of a very high fire. But there are some Jews, Jewish men, who do not obey you. They are Shadrach, Mishap, and Abednego. You gave them authority to take care of everything in Babylon region. Those men do not respect your authority. They do not give honor to your God. They do not worship your gold statue. Imagine this. When Nebuchadnezzar heard this, he was very angry. He told his servants to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to him. So they brought those men to stand in front of the king. Now, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is this true that you do not give honor to my gods? And you do not worship the gold statue that I have built? Next time you hear the sound of the special music, you must obey my rule. You must bend down and you must worship the statue that I have built. If you do not worship the statue, my, my servants will throw you immediately into the middle of the very hot fire. There is no God who can save you from my power. Listen to what this king is saying. Ha! Say it. Ha! Ha! Tell the enemy that every time the enemy tries to intimidate you, you say, ha. Listen to what Daniel, I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego does in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 16, the easy read. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to say anything to show you that we are not guilty. For oh, Nebuchadnezzar lost it. How can anyone disobey my commands? As the supreme ruler of Babylon, he expected absolute obedience. But his pride caused him to go beyond his authority. Turn to Daniel chapter 3, verse 17, the easy read. We serve a great God. If you throw us into that very hot fire, he is able to keep us safe. Yes, sir. He will keep us safe from your power too. Can you imagine? When Nebuchadnezzar heard that, he had them intensify the fire twice as hot. But they said, ha. Listen, Daniel 3.18, easy read. But even if they, even if he does not save us, we still will not serve your gods. And we will not worship the gold statue that you have built. We want you to understand that very clearly, sir. They say, ha! Folks, when we, the branches, are connected to Jesus and remain, see, remain connected, we bear fruit. Now here's the question. What can we really get out of being partly connected. Can we be loving, partly loving, partly joyful, partly peaceful, partly patient, partly kind, partly good, partly faithful, partly self-control? If we are only partly committed, what good is that? Think about it. It's like having one foot in the door and one foot out. The word says you can't serve two masters. Devote yourself to one. Who are you going to serve? And I can tell you there are times when I really don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to be kind. I don't want to be patient. I don't want to deal with people. Yeah, those feelings come. But I choose to be obedient and to trust them. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't. I'm just saying that there are feelings that we're going to have that we have to come against. 
if we want to live a life based on feelings or the world's culture and all the immoral standards, you know, we can't justify that with good intentions. Our foot is still be out the door. That's not being fully devoted. And it will only lead us back to that same old destructive pattern. No judgment. To say, let's make a choice. If we are really sharing our faith, thinking so much about what people think about us, what? Maybe you think you're thinking more about yourself. Who does that benefit? We might find that we are barely holding on to the skin of our teeth here. Folks, pre-deciding to remain and live with an ongoing pursuit of Jesus, laying it all on the table, all on the line, not holding back, that's where we need to be. Not to state the obvious, but the branch needs divine. You don't stay connected if you are a dead limp. And being lukewarm doesn't cut it. We lose our life source. Don't laugh, but I had a plant that I, it was beautiful. I love to look at this plant. And one day, this, one of the stems sort of bent. It was limp. I mean, it was just hanging there. I tried my best to try to, to keep it together, to try to, you know, heal it or something, you know. But it died eventually. It, was, it wasn't flowing. If we are not fully devoted, we are not, uh, we will not flow. If we are not fully devoted, committed, we will not flow. Here's an ouch moment. A life with Jesus doesn't happen accidentally. We have to pre-decide. We need to pra be practical. That's the game plan here, folks. Seek ye first the kingdom. Then ask. What part of my life I know I got to get right? No judgment, of course. Predecide a time, place, a positive approach to taking a stand. You know, I remember uh, my life, uh, I was trying to uh, serve, you know, I was just looking to be faithful. I was seeking the Lord. I was reading the word consistently. I was, you know, I was trying to give up my bad habits. You know, I was um, just trying to put all my time and energy on, on getting it right. But I was having trouble giving up, giving up my time. That's right. And so some things are just not easy to give up. My excuses were, uh, what can I offer? What can I do to make a difference? You know, to be honest, I was afraid to commit because I was afraid that I was going to lose myself. Giving control was never an option. It was a whole new world for me until the Lord told me to volunteer, which led me to teaching in a children's ministry class. And although I was still questioning my abilities, I knew that my duty to God came first. You see, that's devotion. I wanted to remain connected as if I was doing everything unto the Lord. And he transformed my life. I started to, to spend more time with the Lord. I started to, you know, again, still a little bit insecure. I spent even more time talking to God, listening to God, and, and aligning my heart to what will last. My devotion transformed my desires. That's right. I started hearing from him and started to, he started to direct my steps. You know, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding became my guide. It, it happened so fast that before I knew it, I was a pastor. I didn't start out thinking I wanted to be a pastor. Not at all. Folks, it doesn't get... Um, let me put it this way. God doesn't get what's left over. God's not just part of our lives. God is our life. 
That's devotion. When all your decisions at work, in your relationship, your finances, your parenting, all of it, not just some of it. See, we never devote to Jesus by accident. It's predecided. Seek him first, for he is the one who matters most. Everything else will bear fruit after that. Think about that. The moment we start to resist God's leading, the distractions begin. The reason to want to quit sets in. See, getting closer to God is our true source of power and victory. I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Psalm, chapter 46, verse 1 and 2, the Amplified Version. God is our refuge and strength, mighty and impenetrable, a very present and well-proved help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth sh should change, and though the mountains will be shaken and slipped into the heart of the seas. What do you hear? What are some ways that we can practice being devotion, devoted to Jesus throughout this week? Ask yourself, what's the difference between being partly devoted and fully devoted? Look, describe a time, a moment when you felt though that you were close to God. How does this time compare to your life right now? What, what, what might we need to change your life to begin feeling closer to God again? If you're here today and you're struggling, I want to pray for you right now. You know, I don't want you to forget to pray this week to find someone because it will be very helpful to be able to be used by God in such a way. Send them a encouraging word. But right now, I want to pray for you. If you're here, I want you to bow your heads. Father, I pray that you will give us, Lord, your power right now as we are seeking you first, asking you to use us mightily right now in this time. We ask for your blessing. We ask that you will fill these saints right now with your Holy Ghost power, Lord, giving them vision, giving them empowerment to see things beyond the moment, to be able to be used by you in a mighty way. We thank you for their victory already, even before they get started. You already manifested this truth. We thank you, Lord, for healing, to restoring, and for blessing us beyond measure in the mighty name of Jesus. And all the saints said, amen and amen. Well, remember, right after this sermon, we're going to have the Q&A. Please join us. If you have questions, you want to share a little of what you got from the Word, we will love to have you and to be a part of this time. Amen. Happy Father's Day. And remember, you can find all our information at livingword.nyc. Happy Father's Day. God bless you all. Take care.